Welcome to another episode of History Hack. Alex, tell us, who have we got on today? You know how we said we wanted Cold War and we really wanted Cold War and we didn't have anyone to do Cold War? Yeah. We have Cold War. Woohoo! We have, uh, woo-hoo. We have well, no, not woohoo for the Cold War, but woohoo for us because people are interested in it and we definitely are. Um, we've got with us today Ian McGregor. Um, he's, he's in publishing and he's worked with authors such as Ranulph Fiennes, Melvin Bragg, Simon Schmar, Max Hastings, but we don't care about any of them today. Sorry, guys. We're here to talk about Checkpoint Charlie the Cold War, the Berlin Wall, and the most dangerous place on earth. This is Ian's book, and it was published to critical acclaim to coincide with the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and explores the history surrounding the war by weaving together first-person experiences. Hi, Ian, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. No, you're very welcome. How is lockdown for you? Uh, I'm getting more reading done, that's for sure. So obviously my day job, uh, I publish uh, non-fiction, primarily uh, history, lots of different periods, uh, like you guys talk about. So you obviously get a lot of proposals coming in and some of them can be really big. About, you know, sometimes they'll send you the full manuscript. So it's just nice to take a little bit of a backseat breather at home and have time to really delve deep and pick out the proposals I want to properly uh, analyze and just think about whether i want to publish or not so that's good you being subjected to online workouts though aren't you i am um, i did joe wicks this morning uh primarily because my kids uh begged me to because i've i've cried off for the last couple of weeks because i've I, I i think i came down with the bug and i've been in bed a couple of days ill uh, so i did it today and I'm, I'm luckily this is audio because i'm looking very red and sweaty <laughs> But you're here to tell the tale. Let's, I am, talk, about, I am. let's, let's talk about your book. Uh, Alina, hit us up with the first question. So, obviously, we're talking about the Cold War, and we can't talk about the Cold War without talking about Berlin. So, yep. tell us a bit about Berlin post World War II. What state was it in, and can you explain all of these divisions? Sure. Well, obviously, Berlin, uh, uh, if you did the life like if you did the autobiography of Berlin, say for instance, it's not one of the oldest capital cities in Europe at all. It's only been around properly since the days of Frederick the Great in the 18th century. So its lifespan isn't like Paris or London. Uh, but obviously by the time of uh, the dawn of the Second World War, uh, it was one of the most exciting places uh, to live in if you're looking around at what was going on in, in Europe at the time rise of fascism, the rise of communism, uh, the depression, uh, the roaring 20s, and then we go into the 30s with the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party and how he took control of the country. So yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. And obviously it was the epicenter of where the Western allies wanted to get to and where obviously Stalin and, and Russia wanted to get to by the time they were pushing Hitler back and, the, and uh, the Nazi war machine. There was a race to try and get to the city, but at the expense of the fact that Hitler was never going to leave the place, uh, he wanted to die a martyr, the city was totally destroyed, whether by RAF and American bombing during the last two years, two and a half years of the war, uh, and then obviously by the, the Soviet invasion of the city itself in, nine, in the spring of 1945. So you're looking at 70% of housing within a five-mile radius of the city, uh, city center was destroyed. Uh, the, the Russians were fighting street by street and demolishing as they go. And, and that were what, what was left by the time uh, RAF Bomber Command and the American Air Force had, had decimated it too. So what the, the Allies inherited when they arrived was pretty much like a lot of cities and, and major towns in Germany was a, a destroyed place with the, the inhabitants just scraping to survive. Uh, the, the city itself was obviously divided. That was the agreement from the Potsdam conference that they'd had between the, the, the Allied leaders and Stalin. Uh, there were four sectors that, the, that mirrored the country itself was to be broken up into the four sectors, France, America, Britain, and obviously the Soviet Union. Uh, one point that I picked up on when I was interviewing veterans, especially the British veterans uh, that went back right to the 1950s, that one sore point they had was that they had to give away part of uh, the British sector to keep the French happy because at the time the French hadn't actually been allocated a sector in Berlin and uh, the British sector uh, 
kindly uh, handed over a portion of their sector to them to, to manage. So what you had was, in effect, uh, if the Russians decided, which they did eventually, that they weren't going to leave eastern uh, Germany, their sector, uh, you had a city that was an international city by then with the four sectors that was 70 miles behind what was a barrier to the rest of Western Europe. And obviously right up until the death and beyond of, of Stalin in 1953, uh, they did their best to consolidate this buffer zone that they'd established where they obviously uh, owned, you could say, uh, the, the Eastern European states, Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and obviously East Germany. Uh, they weren't gonna give this up. So the Allies then found themselves prior to the Berlin Wall of having uh, a to face the Iron Curtain, as Churchill famously called it, where they couldn't go any further. But obviously 70 miles inside this territory, there was this uh, wonderful city that they still owned half of or still uh, occupied half of. And that was always going to be the pressure cooker for the next 28, 30 years of the life of the Cold War. Wow. Um, so moving towards the 1950s, uh, why why have people got no intention of releasing their control of Berlin? There's a great quote attri uh, attributed to Khrushchev. You can tell me whether it's true or not. Apparently he said that Berlin was like the testicles of Europe. All he had to do was squeeze and everybody screamed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that, it was just, a, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, uh, he was a bit of a gangster. I think he used to, like, <laughs> used to use gangster talk. But uh, yeah, in, in simple terms, yes. It's, what he means is it was the pressure point where, for all intents and purposes, uh, the two blocks, the Western Bloc and the Eastern Bloc, faced off against each other only over a, a couple of hundred yards with uh, police and border troops that were armed to the teeth, so Berlin was probably one of the most heavily armed cities in Europe, if not the world at the time. Uh, obviously the allies themselves had uh, probably about 10,000 troops all told all together in there, as well as uh, intelligence units, that kind of thing. They had a few squadrons of tanks. Uh, they had intelligent corps. They might've had the odd special forces, which I talk about in the book that no one knew about, but again, up against them were hundreds of thousands of troops, thousands of tanks and thousands of planes surrounding them in this island that was in the middle. So quite rightly, Khrushchev was saying, you know, we're allowing you almost to, to have uh, this amazing uh, uh, jump off point into communist territory. Uh, but we can withdraw that invitation any time we want because obviously there wasn't any written agreement that the, the allies could stay there. And it became, it was a game of chess. It became like uh, uh, the Khrushchev wanted to follow Stalin's plan of ultimately having a, a denutralized militarily uh, Germany. Uh, he didn't want any kind of uh, replay of what had happened in the Second World War where there might be an excuse to decimate Eastern Europe and then into Ukraine and then into Russia itself. Uh, that was the key thing any Soviet leader didn't want. So the, 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 the fact that uh, you now had East and West Germany and West Germany would eventually be uh, supported and taken into NATO. Uh, there would be huge military bases from the Allies based in West Germany. There would be ultimately nuclear weapons placed in West Germany. It's a stone's throw away to Moscow when you're talking about missile launches. And that's why to the Russians, they always wanted a, a, a neutral Germany. This actually sounds really terrifying, all of these tanks and soldiers and everything else. I'm quite interested in, in the people of Berlin. Mm. Um, how, how did they cope under these circumstances and how did it differ from the East to the West? Uh, it's a good question. Well, it's, uh, that was one of the key things I wanted to uh, interview, uh, find and interview East and West German and East and West Berlin citizens to find out what life was like, not just from an adult perspective, but from a child perspective as well, across the whole life of the wall. So just before it went up to when it came down. So uh, to be very quick, because obviously we have to be, uh, before the war went up, there was a lot of free movement between the sectors. So uh, families uh, could 
crisscross the city to go and visit relatives, to see loved ones. Uh, people could crisscross as, as we do normally in any city nowadays. Obviously, we're not doing it now because of the lockdown. But as people did anywhere, they, they crisscross the city to, to go to work and come back again or take their kids to school or whatever. Uh, so before the war went up, that was pretty much okay and was still in place and explained why that as the grip of communism took control of East Germany and the standard of living fell heavily and the working conditions increased and the state security apparatus uh, took control of the country as well. So citizens' rights were distinguished, extinguished, I should say. Uh, more and more people found it easy to leave East Germany into West Germany and into Western Europe, but via obviously the, the freedom they found to crossing the border. So the, the people I talked to talked about that time with great affection and uh, the many anecdotes in the book talking about how they met their families and they would have these arguments about politics and the, uh, the unfair distribution of, of wealth within the city itself uh, and the, the inequality in the, uh, the monetary system as well because obviously the Western currency could buy you a lot more than the Eastern currency that, that both sides were trying to make sure their population spent. But then obviously as, when the wall came, came up or was, was built, I should say, some of the best interviews I got were, were talking to uh, West Berliners who were obviously in shock uh, were deeply concerned about relatives that they had on the other side. What would happen to them? Would they ever see them again? I talked to East Germans that again were, some of them were definitely had bought into the, the government propaganda and saw the wall as necessary or their, their, the great socialist experiment their country was trying to do where, you know, free education, free healthcare, job for life, that kind of thing. Uh, would be lost and so it had to be protected with this anti-fascist barrier as it was called uh, whereas obviously others saw it for what it was was they're actually keeping us in we're in a gilded cage I mean I wouldn't even call it a gilded cage but we're in a gilded cage here and we're not getting out and that was very evident by people that I interviewed in the early 60s who witnessed people being shot injured or killed as they tried to run across the death strip and get over the first generation of the war which was quite simplistic so it was easier to get over and you know as the, uh, the statistics prove which I talk about in the book as well that the great many people I mean to over 200 people died trying to get over the wall and the vast majority of them were shot and killed uh, in the 60s because that's when you had the best chance of trying to get uh, to escape because the the death strip wasn't as sophisticated as it was by the, the time of 1989 when the wall fell. Really, I will get into this because I had no, co I have no concept of the the wall as something that evolves. It's not there, and then mm. it is. Um, but first, tell us politically, how do we get to the point where there is a wall? Well, it's uh, 1945 in May, June. You've got the Allies coming in. The Russians have already been in control for quite a few weeks because obviously they captured the city. Uh, and this is a, run, a long running, uh, not argument, but it's a long running theme throughout the life of Berlin and the Cold War, which I try and capture in the book, is to talk about the Russians, you could argue quite rightly felt that they deserved the right to uh, occupy the whole of the city because they'd, they'd expended so much blood uh, capturing it. Over 80,000 Russian troops died uh, and hundreds of, hundreds of thousands were, were wounded capturing Berlin in 1945, fighting street by street until it was occupied. So they felt it was theirs, but obviously under the Potsdam Agreement between Stalin, uh, Roosevelt had obviously died by then, so it was Truman who was now in control, and, uh, and Churchill who were then obviously given to Attlee. It was decided that obviously it was an inter Berlin would be an international city. So along those lines, that they split the country, which I, I just briefly discussed, the city itself would be the same. So as they moved in, it's uh, what kind of city are you going to have? How is it going to be controlled? How are the, the, the occupying powers who initially worked well together? So the four powers had representatives at the table almost, that ran alongside the council and the police forces, which had been rebuilt very, very quickly in the, in the few months after the end of the war. Uh, but from 
mid-1945, right up until the, the blockade that Stalin introduced in 1948, you've got a battle to control the city itself, which mirrors the battle con to control East and West Germany. As I'd said before, Stalin was never really going to give up uh, having a strong hold in, in Europe, and he certainly wasn't going to allow uh, Germany to reunify and become armed again in the future. So if he couldn't uh, win agreement from the Allies that they were going to have a, a, a neutral Germany, then he was going to keep his share of it, which obviously was over a third and contained over 17 million citizens microcosm that down to the city itself and it, that's what what was going on as well so there was, there was a fight to control the city politically uh the communists obviously right up until 1948 and into the early 50s were slowly having a stranglehold on the other eastern states poland bulgaria romania czechoslovakia and it was no different in east germany so you had walter albrecht who would eventually become the leader of uh, the East German state uh, and was the one who would institute the building of the wall. His job was to, to come in uh, in the, the latter part uh, uh, of the 40s and into the 50s to take control of the, the, the socialist elements within the East uh, Berlin Council and slowly liquidate his opponents, take control of the council, take control of the political leadership in the city itself and undermine the Western allies. And so, like I said, up until the Berlin airlift, where it really, for all intents and purposes, escalated to almost open warfare, that's where the, uh, the battle was fought. And it got to the point where the allies realized they weren't going to have a, a neutral city, a whole neutral city of Berlin. They weren't going to have a, a neutral uh, whole country they would have to rebuild their sectors of West Germany and equally they would have to build their sectors of West Berlin so gradually right up and through to the beginning of the blockade that's what was happening so streets were being cleared buildings were being refurbished buildings were being uh, rebuilt the ones that had been destroyed like I said 70% of housing had been destroyed that was all going on on the Western side and they were introducing their own currency because they were fed up waiting for the Russians on the, on the Russian side, they were too busy dismantling whatever heavy industry they could get their hands on to take back to Russia itself and help rebuild their country, which had obviously been completely decimated by the Nazi invasion. 70,000 villages have been destroyed. 27 million people have been killed. So they had their own rebuilding program to do. They didn't particularly care about East Germany. They just used it as a jumping off point to siphon off as much money and machinery as possible to help rebuild their own structure. So you had that going on all the time. And it was ramping up as, as well as it was around the world because by 1950, you then had... Uh, a communist China. So America found itself drawn up against a, an implacable and even bigger enemy than they had against the Nazis. So that's where you get the, 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 the blocks really, really cementing themselves in to say, this is our part of the globe and we're not giving it up. Uh, and now we're in a fight to the finish to see who politically and economically and militarily can, can become the winner. Uh, and at the same time, ominously, as, as I knew when I was growing up in the 80s, 70s and 80s, you had a proliferation of nuclear weapons, which made it a whole different ballgame in terms of uh, what kind of destruction would be meted out if it turned into World War Three, which no one wanted. Ian, excuse my ignorance. I mean, the last time I studied the Cold War was back at A-level, which was you know only a few years ago. But could you tell us a bit more about Operation Rose? Uh, so this is the wall. This is the, the the wall that they were going to build, which started on August 13th, 1961. Uh, it was the code name given to the barriers going up. It, it had taken, I mean, at the moment, if you read the history books, uh, uh, Albrecht is famous for giving various uh, uh, media uh, interviews to the, to the world's press, not just the, the communist press, but the, the Western press were there as well, saying no one's got an intention of building a wall. But as you were talking about with Khrushchev saying we've got to squeeze the testicles, he was equally having his testicles squeezed by uh, Albrecht. He was saying, look at the, uh, the amount of people, my people that are leaving the country. Over 2 million people, had, by 1961, over 2 million East Germans had left East Germany uh, to find better lives in, in the West. 
and of these over 50 percent were under 25 years of age so like any country that's your lifeblood especially if they're the professional classes they're going to be your teachers your engineers your doctors uh these are the people that were realizing there was no future for them in east germany and were leaving via the the valve that you had in the sectors of berlin where there was free crossing uh within reason of the sectors there was there was there was policing but it was if you knew how to get across you could get across and that's what millions hundreds of thousands were doing so Operation Rose was in response to that. The only way they could logically think about how can we stop this, the only way we can is to physically stop them. And so it took weeks in planning. Uh, Ulbricht got his team together. He was given the green light by Khrushchev after he presented his plans at the Kremlin in Moscow to say this is how we'll go about doing it. And it was to seal off the whole city, not just build a wall across the sectors, it themselves but to surround those sectors in their hinterland that faced out onto the east german countryside just to make sure no one was getting through at all so that's 78 miles of barrier and that took tons of barbed wire took tons of cement posts uh, and that was just to put up the initial barriers and one of the interesting uh, facts that i found when i was doing the research in berlin was the, uh, the, 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 the pictures, which I show, which is what I show school kids when I do presentations of the book to them. I talk about mm. this and I show photos of, of how decimated East Berlin still looked by the early 1960s. I mean, it's just rubble. And though there were the famous streets like Unter den Linden, which has obviously the Brandenburg Gate at the end of it, that had all been cleared and that had all been rebuilt. Vast areas of East Berlin, even in the city centre, were still rubble. And there had been major funding to to gather the materials to do the refurbishment and the rebuilding of the city like the west was doing but nearly all of those materials now went into building this wall and that's why for years after the wall went up east berlin citizens were still saying well when are these flats getting built and, and all you had to do was look at the wall you think that's when the materials have gone into to building it so operation rose caught everyone by surprise they just there was there was the odd niggling kind of worry that why are uh why, are, why has there been troop buildups outside of the city? Uh, other people who were getting through the sectors into the Western sector from East Germany, going through East Berlin into the sectors were giving back reports when they were debriefed saying, well, I'm seeing all these lorries in side streets. I'm seeing tons and tons of materials uh, stored everywhere. But the allies and the allies intelligence services didn't put two and two together to think actually there they are definitely definitely going to do something big here no one envisaged that they could they could actually successfully seal off a whole city not just build the wall but cut off streets cut off all transportation seal off the sewers underneath to make to make it pretty much airtight i just i had no idea that it was one side i i don't know in my head i guess i always assumed it was a joint venture that it was one side that did it yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, well, yeah, obviously, I mean, if the Allies had had their way, they, they, they were very, very happy uh, on the ground anyway to have these civilians coming through. Because obviously, if, if you're just a normal uh, serviceman in this international city and you're watching all these East Germans coming through, I suppose you would think, well, our side's winning. Our way of life is winning because look at them. They're, they're just pouring through. Mm -hmm. uh, if this carries on, the country's going to be on its knees and we'll win. We'll get Germany back and we'll get all of Berlin back. But if you think about the bigger picture, which is probably what they weren't doing, they were think, they didn't realize they, 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 your imagination wouldn't take in the fact that someone would actually seal off the whole city. It just hadn't been done. I mean, it hadn't been done for centuries. I mean, it, it might've been done in some far flung place like China or I don't mm. know. I mean, it, it just, I think, like I said, it's uh Kennedy is famous, just as you mentioned the famous Khrushchev speech, Kennedy's famous for saying, well, a, a wall is a lot, hell of a lot better than a wall. Sorry, a wall is a lot better than a war. Because obviously at the time, Kennedy uh, was in the infancy of his presidency. He'd, uh, he'd already met Khrushchev at the famous Vienna summit in June of that year, where they'd obviously had to talk about a lot of things, uh, nuclear proliferation, that kind of thing. But clearly Khrushchev came to the table thinking I want the Berlin uh, situation solved and 
that was over the course of the few days they were together in, in Vienna, which was a massive world event and was covered by the press. Khrushchev is famous for absolutely uh, being bellicose, bullying, uh, overbearing to this young president who thought his usual charm and big Hollywood smile and friendliness uh, might be able to persuade him to try and solve the issue to the where the Americans would be happy or the Allies would be happy. Just didn't happen. And he's famous for coming out of the meetings, badly beaten, badly, you know, very badly beaten and, and embarrassed, saying to his brother, well, that was just like talking to dad, but without the jokes. Uh, so that had just ramped up the whole situation. So from all the way through to uh, the, the conference in Vienna in June, all the way through to the next couple of months in August, you've got both sides ramping up the pressure. So the Americans are now saying, we're gonna invest millions, if not billions of dollars in, in our weaponry and calling up reservists, or we're gonna expand our, our military presence in Europe. Uh, and the Russians are saying, well, we're gonna do the same in East Germany. We're gonna put more troops in. Uh, so it, it, something had to happen. And I suppose in hindsight, maybe allowing the Germans to build a wall where you're going to have the heartbreak of East Berliners and obviously uh, it's, it's heartbreak for Germans in general, but it's better than actually going to war. Do you know, I actually really, I enjoy Khrushchev's diaries. Um, my friend actually got me mm. copies for, for my birthday a few years ago and I can talk about him for ages, but um, I actually want to hear about stats and I love stats personally. It works great in my research. So talk to us about the stats about the wall and how big of an endeavor truly was it? Well, imagine if you, you obviously if you costed it in today's terms, it cost billions and you're talking about, like I said, it's 78 miles of the initial barriers going up and, and they were, they were general. I mean, it was basically at first it was, uh, barbed wire and cement posts that was that was a toe in the water for the east german authorities because obviously they were paranoid and worried that what that would the allies do and as soon as they realized the allies aren't going to push back and they're not going to send some tanks in to to push this over with, within a day day and a half that's when the the proper building began and the breeze blocks start going up so that's your first generation of the wall uh which is still very costly. Like I said, it, it used up a lot of the materials or material that, that, that the East Germans had, had put aside for actually rebuilding the city. Uh, but then as time goes on, obviously it becomes more sophisticated because you're dealing, you, they respond to how the Berliners and the East Germans themselves uh, are acting to try and get round uh, it's like a massive experiment to try and get around this initial barrier that's been put up. So people tunneled underneath it. They try to smash through it. They try to sail over it or, or fly over it, I should say. Uh, and so the barriers become even more sophisticated. So then guard towers go up. Uh, guard runs are in, uh, sorry, guard towers are around. Dog runs are installed. The place becomes electrified. Uh, you have automatic machine gun posts put in. Uh, you have a dedicated border force, tens of thousands of men uh, and women, and that costs money to, to house, feed, and pay them. Uh, and if that's over a few years, maybe your, your, you know, uh, your, your GDP won't be that affected. But when you're talking about it becomes one of the, the, the main uh, siphons of a country's GDP over the years for 28 years. And so by the time, and I've, I've got a great diagram of how the final war looked uh, by 1989. And obviously it's called, it had been called the death strip already back in the sixties when most people were getting shot. But by that time it was proper hunger games because I, I like saying hunger games to students today because then they, they do kind of really can picture it in their mind's eye. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about, uh, You've got the old wall at the start of the death strip, which is three meter high, uh, concrete wall top with barbed wire. You then got an inner two meter high signal fence with uh, signal equipment linked to the guard towers that are placed every uh, two, 300 yards. Uh, you've got these state of the art uh, 
guard towers that give you a 360 degree uh, view of, of what you're looking at. Uh, and there's, there's a great uh, guard tower still in central Berlin. It's one of the only ones left and the locals, you can go up it and have a look. And the, the locals actually call it Last of the Mohicans. That's just a little point I'm throwing. But then you've got floodlight, it's all floodlit. Uh, but then you've got the tank traps, you've got the asphalt road that runs through the middle of the death strip, which links the, the guard towers together that you could literally drive the whole 78 miles round. Uh, and then you've got the famous wall that we all know from the scenes we see in 1989, where it's the famous L-shaped barrier that was 3.6 meters high uh, and topped with that circular, almost like a, a drain pipe on the ends and that's just to stop you obviously trying to get a hold if you if you manage to get through the rest of it you've then got to climb over that so if we try to do that to london it would cost billions uh and that's the kind of stats i was trying to sh say in the book it's the country was uh, by 1989 anyway the country was economically bankrupt i mean by the time the new guard took in who eventually realized they couldn't put up a fight after uh, Honecker had, had uh, been uh, taken down in a, in a bloodless coup. It was only then that they were allowed to see the finance books of the country that Honecker had, uh, had obviously kept to himself. And they realized that the game was up. The Russians weren't going to help him. But they'd seen how much this venture had cost in terms of materiel and manpower. And it's, it just staggers the imagination, all to keep their own citizens in. And if you think... If they just spent that kind of money on building the kind of socialist paradise they kept saying they wanted to have, maybe it would have made a huge difference. Because obviously, a lot of these Germans I talked to said that even though uh, you didn't question to a degree your lot in life, because obviously you knew you had a job and you had an education, uh, they looked at what the West had and they looked at what they had and, and they, they, they were angry about it because they could see for themselves, you know, all this money being spent on security. And, and, we ha and I haven't even talked about the Stasi and, what, and you know, the security apparatus that, that had one in four of the population as informants. Again, that costs money. Uh, the amount of money they spent on everything to do with uh, securing their hold on power uh, was probably the biggest junk, chunk of D GDP they spent over the, the country's life. That's insane. Um, you it said you spoke to people um, at the that were there at the time. You interviewed yes. people who actually built the wall with their hands, the initial wall. Is that right? Who were they and, and how did they feel? Uh, well, I, I interviewed uh, soldiers who were border guards who were in charge uh, on a I, I, I interviewed quite a few of them across the lifetime of the wall. So obviously I interviewed people that were there at the time the wall, came, the, 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 the border gates came open. I, I interviewed a commander who was in charge of one of the, the control sections there. But yeah, I interviewed a couple of guys who were in their eighties, who were soldiers, border guards, who were in charge of protecting the actual workers who were building the wall. Uh, and again, they were it was it's, it's just interesting because when you're sitting in someone's flat in east germany and it's like going back in time because they've got uh it's very sparsely decorated and they've got their photos up of their time and service and you could argue obviously you could argue all day long with them about what they that the, the whole reason for their country being in existence and their whole security apparatus was was an abomination but to them obviously they're very proud of their service and they're proud of the state that they served as well so they've got photos up and everything else but when i talked to these guys yeah i mean that that's what came across they were very uh they were very politically aware they were very uh uh understanding of why th what had to be done was done but obviously the memories they were giving me of the time itself they were very much not in the know of what was going on everything was kept operation rose was very much uh, a very well kept secret very well maintained in the communist fashion of of of, of uh, when they were fighting the nazis as well and everything was kept at a need to know level right to the very top uh, with these guys, they, they didn't even know where they were going until just before midnight when their own officers, who themselves didn't know, were given their orders. They were in a, a certain part of the city, but then they were told, right, we are driving to location X. That's where we're going to get out of the trucks. That's where we're going to 
fan out and man the perimeter. And their instructions were to protect the workers, but equally and more ominously, it wasn't actually to, to look outwards towards the West to, uh, to see what the Americans, French or British would do. It was more to have their, their eyes and their, their weapons trained on their own people to see if any of uh, the East Berliners would actually stop or try and prevent the workers uh, from building the wall once they cottoned on to what they were actually doing. So to, to meet those guys was, I, I, it's a privilege actually, because it's, it's oral history is always my most favorite uh, type of book that I publish. And the hairs on the back of your neck go up, whether you're interviewing, I've, I, you know, I've been lucky. I've, 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 uh, I've published guys that uh, fought in the first and second world wars and the Korean war. So to, to meet, these guys too it was you're literally sitting down with living history of momentous moments and to think of why well, one guy I interviewed he was uh you know he was at checkpoint charlie uh guarding the guys who were actually painting the white line of where the 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 wall was going to be built so and to look him in the eye and and he's absolutely uh you know chuffed to bits to be talking about it and to be uh celebrating what they did and and that's what i try and capture in the book to say that you know both sides believed in what they were doing absolutely right up until even some of the bar the guards that i talked to in 1989 and you know they're younger now obviously they're they're in their early 70s again i i go into their east german flats sit down with them and they were the same they were some of them were bitter about how it happened and and uh some of them thought that they uh they were placed in an impossible position. They thought that the, the powers that be had made a mistake, obviously, in announcing in 1989 that travel restrictions were lifted, click of a finger, it had been done. And it gave them no time, no warning to actually figure out how best they could facilitate that. And they very uh, readily blamed the powers that be. They, they didn't think anything that they'd done in their service, and some of them had worked on the wall for two decades at least, and gone up through the ranks to where they were commanders of, uh, of checkpoints. They didn't believe they'd done anything wrong and the system that they'd served was a good system. And again, you get this thing that the Germans call nostalgia, nostalgia for, for what life was like afterwards and, and they hark back to that. And that that's pretty much, didn't matter whether I was talking to border guards, policemen or Stasi, they all had that opinion. And you could argue it's indoctrination, but then again, you, you just take it for what it's worth and you, you record it. Mm. I, I completely agree with you about the oral history and I'm assuming Alex does as well. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to sit across from someone and hear, hear their actual yeah. history. Talk, I mean, talking I was, about, sorry, go, go for it, go for no, it. No, I was, I was just gonna add, I, I talked about these. From the Western side, it, it was very emotional. It was. That's what the, the complete difference was when I sat down with West, West Berliners, uh, the emotion that came talking to them from if they were there and witnessed the wall going up to where they may have been there in 1989 and the wall came down. And we'd be sitting in, in a cafe and I'd be interviewing them in Berlin and, and great interview and very jolly and, and they're very excited to be telling you their personal memories. But as soon as you come up to either the wall being built or the wall being opened, they pretty much every one of them, and there was over a dozen of them, burst into tears. And they just got very emotional about it. And you'd have a moment to turn the recorder off and, and let them collect their thoughts and then we'd carry on. But that, that was the difference. That was the difference. That's it. I'd like to know a bit more about the ordinary people and how they yeah. adapted in the early 1960s to the presence of this humongous war that's been built. Yeah. So uh, one person I was absolutely thrilled to, because uh, I had to track her down because uh, I, it was hard to f find her online, is a, a woman called Marguerite Hosseini. And she has been interviewed before, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s for an American documentary. But she now lives uh, in West London and she's uh, 84 and she had an amazing childhood uh she lived in west berlin and she arrived there just after the berlin airlift uh had succeeded and her father was a, a french diplomat and they grew up so she basically spent her childhood growing up 
in pre Berlin Wall, Berlin, West Berlin. But obviously, she, her mother was German, and she had uh, relatives sprinkled all throughout the hinterland of East Berlin. So she spent a lot of her childhood going back and forward through the sectors to see her relatives, and she had some amazing memories of of uh, the state of East Berlin, which is what I was telling you about, and the destruction that still hadn't been cleared up. You know. Lots of uh, artillery damage to, to buildings, huge holes in the walls, uh, whole buildings destroyed still, buildings with their roofs off, bullet holes, pockmarking everywhere. She, w- she told me all of this. But to skip forward, s- she captured the horror of the wall being built. So again, she, was, uh, she would have been 13 at the time. And so obviously it was a Sunday, caught everyone by surprise. And the horror for her family was the fact that her younger sister had that Friday gone across as planned to stay with her grandparents in the hinterland of East Berlin. So for the family, they spent the next four or five days frantically uh, checking all the main uh, civilian uh, government departments, trying to find out, well, how do we get her back? Uh, And amid all this, she was seeing German troops, East German troops and border guards, at the front line, at the, 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 the tram lines and the underground that had been now sealed off. As she would see these as she was passing through. So if you see that through a child's eyes, you realize how terrifying it was. And then I try and capture her memories as she's becoming a teenager through the 60s. And, and she witnessed some of, well, nearly all the key moments. She was a, the first uh, major, really big public killing, uh, which I talk about in the book, uh, of uh, an East German teenager, Peter Fechter, which is very famous. I mean, if you Google his name, you'll, you'll get the whole story. But uh, she was in a party, she was a, at a teenager party, an all night party in an apartment that overlooked Checkpoint Charlie. And she could, they could see the death strip from where their building was. And her and her friends witnessed the whole event and she saw this and obviously she was terror struck. But then she also witnessed the arrival of uh, John F. Kennedy when he came to the city and gave his famous speech of Ich bin ein Berliner. She witnessed that and she told me what it was like to be in the crowd of hundreds of thousands of, of West Berliners who were joyous, if not ecstatic, of seeing this charismatic leader of the free world promising them that the city hadn't been forgotten. But from her perspective, she found it a terrifying experience because the crush was incredible and she was fighting, literally fighting, scratching and biting her way to get out of the crowd, otherwise she feared she'd be crushed to death. And then it was her decision to leave uh, West Berlin and, and try and establish a life in London, which she did, and it took her years. Uh, and she became, uh, she started her life out as a cleaner, uh, cleaning the offices of uh, the West German Embassy in London. And over the years, the life of the Cold War, by the time the Cold War finished, she was the cultural attache. Uh, to London for West Germany itself. So her life was amazing, but that, that, that's just one. And then another one was a Berliner from uh, the Western perspective again, but he'd uh, been, been in uh, Berlin when the Russians took over, but he'd, he was lucky enough that he'd been born in America because his family had left Germany in the depression in the twenties and, and lived in the Bronx and that's where he was born. But they were very much admirers of Hitler. So they were Volksdeutsche and returned to the fatherland to fight the war. So he found himself uh, living in a, a cellar with his, his mum and his brother and sister uh, in East Germany, in East Berlin, I should say, under the Soviet occupation. And because he was getting in so much trouble, to cut a long story short, he left, went back to America because he had an American passport, joined the, Amer- the, the American military, who obviously, once they found out who he was, where he was from and, and his excellent language skills, he instantly was enlisted into military intelligence. And he was a spook in Berlin from the mid fifties all the way through to about 63. And again, much like Marguerite Hosseini, he saw all the key events, but from a, uh, an espionage military perspective. So when Operation Rose kicked off in August, he was, uh, he was assigned civilian clothes, given a set of uh, uh, safe houses that he, he could use if he needed to, and a list of phone numbers he needed he could ring. Uh, and he spent the next uh, two months on the eastern side reporting on what was going on. Because obviously this is, I think I talked about it earlier on, it's 
we're lucky we're, we've got this lockdown going on in london but we've got 24-hour news we've got mobile phones we've got smartphones we know everything that's going on throughout the, the world in in terms of covid19 when you're talking about berlin being sealed off with a wall in 1961 they don't have anything so this was the job that this guy adolf nashted great name uh undertook to be the eyes and ears of the allies on the eastern side and then finally one other point was uh there's a guy called stefan voller who now is director of the uh the ddr museum the gdr museum in berlin amazing amazing museum if any of your listeners go to berlin i'd say the first museum they should go to is the ddr museum uh it's on museum island in the center of town and again his life his perspective of what i found was he grew up uh with a father who was in the East German Politburo, the SED Politburo, as an economist. He was an expert. He's a professor of economics. So Stefan grew up virtually swallowing the propaganda of the East German state, what it stood for, where it was going, the paradise it was trying to create against this fascist oppression on the other side. So, And he was in the 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 socialist youth movement when the war went up. So he was actually on a camping trip when he found this out. So I capture his memories, but then I try and also tell the reader how his position changed as his life went on. So by the time of 1989, he'd already been in the peace movement for the last seven or eight years. He'd had huge arguments with his father about where the East German state was going. And he was very, very happy when the wall came down. And once the wall came down, he wrote the very first kind of autobiographical experience of an East German living in a reunified Germany, which became the country's first bestseller. So I, what I try to do in very uh, shortened uh, detail that I've given you is those three are just one of, you know, three of maybe three dozen that I talk to, to try and give the reader a, a 360 degree view of what life was like on both sides of the wall. That's amazing. Um, it just over the next twenty-eight years, though, after the war went up, at least five thousand people apparently attempted to get over it, swim past it, tunnel under it, fly past yeah. it. Of all the testimony you put together, who's moved you the most when it came to trying to get across this brick line? Probably uh, Peter Spitzner, uh, who I talk about. He's got a chapter in the book, and he was one of the very last escape successful escapees in 1989. And again, he'd grown up in the East German States, uh, from, from childhood. That's all he'd known. Uh, and again, he was one of the, the hundreds of thousands of East Germans that not necessarily were hugely politically active against the States. It wasn't about that. He'd literally just got himself known to the authorities just because, and excuse my language, he was pissed off with his, <laughs> his situation, as in uh, his education would go a certain way, uh, and it was almost foretold because of his background. Uh, he grew up in a town called uh, Chemnitz, which uh, is a, a good few hours' drive from Berlin, uh, and that was his life. And basically because he'd, he only, he wanted to be a teacher, but because he'd complained about the lack of choice, democratic choice in the people he was allowed to vote for in his college, he was uh, spotted by the, the local Stasi. He was taken in. He was given a quite terrifying interrogation, which is what I detail in the book. Uh, and again, it, it was the state shooting themselves in the foot and you could multiply this tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of times that they did this to their own citizens where this is a guy who now thinks well i've got to get out of here i've had enough of this i i can't live my life i've got a young daughter uh this is not the life for me what choice do we have and such was his desperation that he was lucky he chose the moment his wife by this time by the 80s if you had a very sick relative uh, that lived in the West. You were allowed to go and visit them, but as long as the other half of your family stayed in East Germany, almost as hostages, you might say. So his wife had gone to Austria to see her sick mother. And that was the point he thought, right, well, this is our chance. This is what we're going to do. So I, in, the, in the, the chapter I tell, and it's, it's just amazing. And again, I just sat down with him and he's telling me this all matter of factly, but the danger they were both in is just incredible. And they came down to Berlin and he's got a, uh, at the time his daughter was nine, uh, parked up their car and spent the next uh, three weeks 
uh, spending their money, uh, living through the kindness of a local uh, Lutheran pastor who gave them accommodation, who knew what they were trying to do. And they, they just went down to Checkpoint Charlie, uh, way obviously down the back streets, not at Checkpoint Charlie, but just begging anyone, whether they're a foreign tourist or an allied soldier who had, you know, who was obviously over there, to, to actually smuggle them in their vehicle and get them out of East Berlin. Because uh, what I hadn't talked about was the, uh, the diplomatic and uh, allied rights were still uh, in situ in the city itself. So if you're wearing an allied military uniform or you have diplomatic plates, uh, or you're a tourist with the, with the, the right papers, you could travel back and forward across Checkpoint Charlie to East Berlin because obviously by the 80s to the East German authorities, they made a lot of money out of this because people were coming in and, and buying uh, consumer items and, and just spending their currency. And that's what these Germans wanted. So there was huge amounts of traffic going back and forward uh, across the uh, Checkpoint Charlie. So that's what he did. And, and it got to the point where they were on their last day and he was thinking, well, this isn't going to happen. I, we've, we're just going to have to go back before we get spotted and I end up in prison. And uh, he met an American serviceman who uh, agreed to, who took a chance and said, yep, okay, get in the boot of my car. And so I spend, without giving the game away, because I want people to buy the book. Absolutely. Uh, he, uh, I detail their adventure of getting down through into Checkpoint Charlie to then the, the, the absolute tension of going through the checkpoints and then getting on to the Western side. And then their life uh, there. And, and, it's, and, and the interrogation he, he then underwent with the American authorities who thought he was a spy. Uh, who, who didn't believe his story at first to then where he's been rehoused and then within a couple of months he's watching he, he's risked his life and his daughter's freedom to do this and then you know he's watching on tv as hundreds of thousands of his countrymen are now coming through the checkpoints and his story is amazing so i just think it just sums up the the futility of the state's desire to micromanage its citizenship its, its citizens i should say sorry uh and if you stepped out of line, they stamped on you well and truly. And, and this was the end result. And he was just one of hundreds of thousands. You just mentioned the fall of the Berlin Wall. But before I ask this question, I just want to add that I was actually in Germany when the Berlin Wall fell down. All right. I was, wow. like, I was four years old. And all I can tell you, all I remember were the bells ringing throughout the whole of Germany. And obviously, you can't tell a four year old exactly that the Berlin Wall is coming down. But yeah, I'll never yeah. forget that moment of when I'm standing in the middle. I can't even remember where we were over for a wedding and the bells are ringing. And it yep. was so intense and such a powerful moment that I can say that I was in Germany just at that moment. No, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, that, that, that again, that, that gets back to my point about West Germans being emotional. Uh, it was just there was crying tears of joy when they were talking to me because it wasn't themselves thinking that, uh, they're free as in West Berlin is now free because they're thinking, well, if the walls come down, it must mean bigger things are afoot and it might mean a huge change in our situation. Uh, dare they think that this, the country itself might be reu reunified, but they're watching their own countrymen come through the checkpoints. And we don't appreciate that because obviously it's never happened to England, Britain as a whole. Uh, we don't have a huge wall going through London. So, we, but, so it's hard to to put yourselves in their shoes. And th that's why I wanted to talk to them face to face to capture that kind of thing. And, and where you're talking about bells ringing, one of the, th the key interviews I had uh, was a, a, a guy called Ulrich Jorgers, uh, Hans Ulrich Jorgers, you call him Uli. And he's like the, the equivalent, so people understand is he's like the Andrew Marr of Germany. He has a successful uh, column in uh, big magazine in, in Germany and he's on TV and radio and politics is his thing. And he's one of the main uh, commentators of German politics has been for the last two decades. And so I was thrilled to go to Berlin to interview him. And he was, he reported on uh, what was going on with the war in the seventies in Berlin, in Berlin. Uh, he was working for Reuters, but he was outside in Hamburg when the wall actually came down. But obviously he rushed, as most journalists did, he rushed to West Berlin to cover the story. But 
he started crying when he said to me he was starting to get telegrams because obviously again this is before we had mobile phones with text and all that kind of thing so you don't get instant messaging but he was coming back to his hotel room and there'd be a stack of telegrams waiting for him and he's reading them all from his his relatives because again his backstory is his family had to flee east germany because his dad was a liberal and obviously the kgb had him targeted so he had to run for his life and took his family with him and they were heartbroken and they deliberately lived in a village right next to the inner German border. Uh, so they could every Sunday from the late fifties all the way through prior to the wall being built, they would have picnics on a Sunday right up by the barrier to the point where they would give some of their picnic to the hungry East German border guards, because in the distance they could see the village that they'd had to uh, flee and Uli for him to say, my parents would hold hands with us, grip them tightly, and, I'd, and we'd stand there in silence. And I'd watch tears run down their cheeks. And as he was capturing this, he then talks about, and they was now sending me telegrams saying, at last, we're going to be reunited again. And he just burst into tears. And it was, and at first I thought, God, what do I say? What do I do? And I just thought, well, just let him recover and, and just get the whole story out because this is fantastic. And again, that, that's, that mirrors what you're talking about, bells ringing. That, that was that's just a microcosm of what all Germans felt in you, West Germany, I should hope. You just, uh, your book is absolutely full of incredible stories like this. Um, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about Germany and the Berlin wall um, and the ins and outs of how it went up because I, I was totally clueless. Um, Alina isn't much better on the subject. Um, I th I've definitely learned loads of you, Alina. Why was your book not out when I was doing this? <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, I spent three years, it took three years. Research and writing, it's taken three years. So uh, the research took nearly two years. Uh, and I could have interviewed a heck of a lot more people. And there's actually probably about half a dozen interviews that I've made that I didn't get in the book, which I wanted to. But I mean, I'd, the book would have been about 200,000 words. And as you know, that's, you can't have a book that big because it would, it would scare people off from wanting to read it. And I, I want them to read the stories because it's the stories that count. I have to say that if you read the Guardian review of this book, I don't think it's very fair. Having spoken to you, um, it kind of implies that you took a lot of uh, American and British yeah, stories yeah. and didn't cover the actual Germans. And, and I know that isn't the case. Yeah, yeah. Well, the same with the Soviets, though. I mean, I interviewed a couple of Soviet soldiers that were uh, in the occupying forces uh, when the war fell. And I got their perspective on on what they how they felt how they felt their regime saying them to stay in barracks because that was the turning point as soon as the russians gorbachev signaled to the east german regime our boys are staying in their barracks no one's going to come and help you they knew the game was up and that's why you had a bloodless revolution and you didn't have a, another Tiananmen square because there was plenty of east german general east german generals that wanted to send the troops in it just didn't happen and then i talked to east german uh troops that were in their academies at the time very much like Tiananmen Square that were way 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 away from the capital that were a couple of weeks before the wall came down and after the wall came down were still being trained in crowd control riot control because they were going to send them in so I, I, again I got their perspective it's brilliant and like you say a completely 360 degree view of of the story thank you so much for joining us thank you thank you for having me Join us tomorrow and we will be talking to the fantastic Catherine Edwards of Birkbeck University um, about women of power in ancient Rome. Um, it's a very interesting listen. Um, I certainly learnt loads. Um, until then, stay safe. If you possibly can, stay at home. This is Nighthawk signing off.